Good morning. Welcome to our worship on this first Sunday after Christmas. The Lord is with you. Amen. And I uh, hope that uh, your celebration uh, of Christmas was good. And if you were not able to, to connect as uh, previous years, uh, I hope that you still were able to use a phone or social media and to be able to find some way to have some communication with your loved ones. And, but of course, uh, there's, there will be, uh, for many people, um, the, the sadness that, uh, not being able to have a close relationship with our loved ones. But uh, we can trust that, again, that's what Christmas is about. It's uh, about God coming into this world and filling that void in people's lives with his presence. And uh, this is our last service for the year 2020. I'm not sure uh, to be sad or to be joyful when it comes to, to that. Um, what will 2021 bring? Uh, the Lord only knows, but he's in control, and we uh, believe that by his grace, whatever happens, that, again, his grace is sufficient. And those words of St. Paul, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Again, thank you for the cards and gifts that have uh, been received by myself and also Pastor Davison. And uh, at this time, we'll light the Christ candle on the Advent wreath. As we light the Christ candle, we remember that God has been faithful and has fulfilled his promise of a savior. In Christ, he has brought the light of the world to us and to all peoples. Heavenly Father, that others may be drawn to the manger and there behold your salvation, who is Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing the opening hymn.
The call to worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In the name of God the Father, who has loved us with an everlasting love, who was faithful to his promise and sent his Son as a Redeemer of the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the fulfillment of the promise of the Father. In the name of the Holy Spirit, who brings us to faith, who moves us to receive Jesus as our Savior, empowering us to be the children of God. Our Redeemer lives. At just the right time, God sent his Son into the world and has now sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts. Pray. Almighty Father, you have made yourself known to us in the giving of your Son, Jesus Christ. He entered this world in our flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Fill us with the power of your Spirit, that we might receive Jesus and be given the power to live as your children and recognize him as our peace. In the name of Jesus. Amen. At this time, we now bring before the Father the things of our hearts. I find myself thankful. Here is the good news. God fulfilled his promise and sent his son Jesus to be our redeemer. Jesus died and rose again to forgive us and give us power to live as the children of God. We are free from our sins. We are free from our stress. We are free to live joyfully and powerfully. Amen. The psalmody. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. Amen. Please be seated.
will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as the garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until the righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our official reading is from Galatians chapter 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you write for the gospel as you're able? The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, that you are prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your holy people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Good place.
Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, some precious nuggets of gold and truths from today's lesson. I pray that uh, your spirit would work in the lives of your people, that they may be able to, to grasp some of this, uh, even uh, working through me, uh, that it would uh, richly bless the quality of their life of faith. Here, and uh, may your spirit uh, bless us our time of meditation, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord is with you. Amen. In his book, Vanishing Grace, Philip Yancey talks about a lady, old Elizabeth. Um, she had been a slave, and at 98 years of age, she became a Christian. And they asked her why, at uh, this late date, that she became a Christian. And she said that it was uh, the opportunity for her to become a somebody in life. And even today, uh, there are millions of people. Nobody's, uh, for instance, as in India with the untouchables, um, who are embracing Christ as Savior. There are people in the slums of uh, South America, again, in the squalor and the trial and tribulation of life there, who are also embracing Christ. There are people um, in various places of the world um, that have that sense of being nobodies, but uh, they can become somebody's in Christ, somebody in their relationship to Christ. And even in our culture, uh, Western culture, people can get lost in the shuffle of life. They can feel alienated and they can feel more as nobodies. But if they would accept their status in Christ, all of that can change and they can be lifted out of the gravitational force of sin and they can be empowered by becoming somebodies. And that's the es essence of the Christian gospel. Um, nobody's being made somebody's. But it's not normally something that's grasped that well in our culture because of everything that surrounds Christmas these days. All the fluff, the bows and the wrapping, the secular songs, uh, the quaint scenes. But that's really not the reality of Christmas. Not even close. I mean, think about it. Joseph and Mary had been five days on the road. She's on a donkey. She's nine months pregnant. Just to imagine, you know, again, what they're feeling and what they're dealing with. And then they get to Bethlehem town. And what's Bethlehem like? And Bethlehem, well, I'm back in those days, was a place that they raised the cattle and the lambs for sacrifice. So if a person was coming from outside the nation of Israel, they would pay a good price for these sacrificial animals. So Bethlehem is, is more of a, a stable. Um, that's uh, what they were, these, this couple was walking into. Uh, with uh, a stable, a stockyard town with all of its uh, sights and smells. And then what about their place of lodging? There was no place in the inn, not even in the attic. And so they end up uh, being forced to, to be outside. And chances are it's a cave that was uh, dug into a, into a hill. And it was a place, it was a shelter for the animals, uh, depending on the elements. If it was stormy, rainy, or whatever it might be, that uh, it was protection for the animals during those more difficult times. And you wonder if they even had a light there on that first Christmas. Well, they were nobodies. And the shepherds were nobodies. 
I mean, the shepherds were the lowest on the rung of that society. But it was to the shepherds that God came with his glory, the angels, uh, the presence of the angels on that night. And it was really the shepherds who were there, and only the shepherds were the only visitors, except for the animals. But there was something even lowlier that was going on at this time. The great God of heaven and earth, the God who dwells in unapproachable light, the pure and holy God, came to this earth and dwelt in the womb of a peasant girl, of a nobody by the name of Mary. And most certainly, over the years and ages, it has been the case that uh, children have been born in stables, but not God being born in a stable. But that's the message, that the great somebody became a nobody so that we could become somebody's in life. And the one who uh, brings this out in today's lesson is St. Paul from the book of Galatians. Can we see the first slide? But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. And there's a lot in there. And how would you unpack that if you were trying to share that with somebody who had never heard the message before? And I was, uh, as I was thinking it through, maybe the first thing that uh, I would try to tell people about regarding this text is the perspective that you get from the time. And it was a Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And uh, during that period of time, the Romans had control of the nations surrounding the Mediterranean, so there was uh, no factions of fighting one nation between the other because the Romans would come in and crush it. And plus there was the Roman roads. Um, they were the wonder of the day where people were able to get around so well. And also there was a Greek language, and that was a second language for people surrounding the, the Mediterranean. So it was a, really a fantastic opportunity for transformation. And so that's exactly what happened when God's Son entered into time and space, again into the womb of a nobody by the name of Mary, the great somebody became a nobody it was the humility of the incarnation that God became a child. I mean, that's uh, the, the wondrous perspective of time. And then um, I think if I would try to share with somebody else this passage of scripture, and I would also talk about the transaction that was involved. And that is, uh, when you focus especially on that word redeem, it helps to understand the, the transaction uh, that was being talked about. And it's a, a transaction that made all the difference in the world for people's lives. And it's a, a transaction that, uh, that took place through what is called the Great Exchange or the substitution, where there's this redeeming that's going on, somebody's in a hole, somebody's stuck, and that other person redeems them, and there's this great exchange that took place. And the exchange that took place is that, again, that God's son was willing to take our sins upon himself at the cross. His life was perfect, and we were able to receive his righteousness this marvelous gift and wonder of God, this great substitution that took place. The great exchange. And again, if uh, you were a Jew back then, uh, you would be under the law, and Jesus was under the law. He had to fulfill all the com commandments, the 613 commandments, of uh, the Hebrew traditions and laws. 
he had to keep all of those. And if you were a, a person who would sin, then we all sin, then you would have to take an animal and to the priest and they're dressed in their holy garb and you would have to sacrifice uh, the animal. You'd lay your hand on the, on the animal indicating your sin being transferred to the animal and the animal was, was killed. And this, I believe, over a period of time could have been difficult for the people of God because the cards are really stacked against them because all of sin and falls short of the glory of God. And I think it's uh, something that people struggle with these days They can say to themselves, for 30 years I've tried to keep all the rules and always I'm falling short, I'm a nobody. And so um, you can uh, take all this and these rules and all this guilt, you can have it. But again, people have missed what really is taking place with Christ. We're at the cross. He took all of our sins and we received his righteousness. Again, it's a a marvelous thing. And St. Paul, to try to help us understand this, used a a concept, um, a a teaching, a a practice from, from back then. It was called adoption, to try to understand this. And if you were a slave, you had no rights, you had no property. But if you were adopted by a family, that all changed. You became an heir. And you would have uh, the inheritance. But also there would be this change where the one who was your master would now be your father. And it would be this uh, shocking accessibility that you would have when it came to uh, your relationship with the father. Shocking as far as for its change. And to share with you uh, the significance of this, I'd like to uh, have you think for a moment that you uh, went to Washington, D.C., and you were uh, going to take a a tour of the White House. So you wait in line, and you're there for a long period of time. Finally, you get in. But would you be able to have an audience with the president? And of course you couldn't because you're one of hundreds of millions of people. You wouldn't be able to. You couldn't get into the Oval Office. But there are exceptions. And back in the 1960s when John F. Kennedy was president, he would be in the Oval Office office with uh, uh, members of his cabinet and they're dressed in their dark suits. They'd be talking about issues like the Cuban Missile Uh, crisis that was going on. But then all of a sudden this would take place. And can we see the next slide? There it is. That's little John John. And John John was able to uh, to come in. Oftentimes he'd even come in without knocking. He'd get up on his father's desk or just crawl through the middle of the desk. He had this... uh, accessibility and he was not concerned about protocol at all. He just wanted to see his daddy. Again, shocking accessibility. And for the people of God back then, what an application, again, this whole issue of adoption. And even for children who were raised in in prosperous families, Before they became older, they were treated as slaves and they had a real slave that was a mentor to them who would follow them, would teach them the A's, ABC's of living, the do's and don'ts of life. And that's what it would be for them uh, in their younger uh, childhood. They'd be like slaves, accountable to the slave. But that all changed when these children came of age. And then no longer were they slaves. And can you just imagine the sense of freedom that they had? No longer was a slave breathing down their necks. And the application of St. Paul is that that's the way that the law was. 
And people, we've been enslaved to it under performance-based acceptance. But that all changed with the coming of Jesus. And now we have the opportunity to have that John-John relationship with God. Later, St. Paul uh, uses the, the phraseology that we can call God Abba, or Father, or Daddy. That's a wonderful opportunity that we have to be able to, to have that kind of a relationship with him. But yet it's something that's not easy for us to grasp. We are still under the law in this culture, performance-based acceptance. The do's and the don'ts, we're very familiar with those things. And in our culture today, when, if you want to see the president, uh, you have to have the credentials. You have to have um, been able to have some kind of an accomplishment to see the president. And it was even more difficult to grasp this in, the, in Jewish society because uh, uh, Jewish people could not even pronounce the name of God. Yahweh, I am who I am. They could not even pronounce that. They would substitute Adonai means Lord. They wouldn't even say the name. They wouldn't even write it. And so can you imagine the pushback when Jesus is using this term of Abba, the Father? St. Paul is using this terminology. Huge pushback. But it was even something that was difficult for the disciples of Jesus to deal with all of this. And perhaps you remember the time when there were parents that wanted Jesus to touch their children, to lay hands, like, like a lay hand on, on the child, to bless the child. And the disciples were almost like uh, patrolmen, the, the bodyguard of the president. And they were trying to uh, stop and refrain these people from coming forward because they knew Jesus was busy. And when it came to children in that culture, they were considered to be nobodies. They were, they were really uh, supposed to stay in deep background in, the, in that society. But we find that Jesus became indignant when he found out that that was taking place. And what does he say? Can we see the next slide? Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And then Jesus said, unless you become as, as a little child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of, of God. So it's almost like to enter into God's kingdom, you have to have that Abba relationship. You have to have that daddy relationship with the Lord in your life. And again, uh, that's the essence of the, the message of the great somebody who became a nobody so that we could become somebodies, that we could be the adopted children of God. But now having said all this, how are you doing when it comes to your Abba relationship with God the Father? Is that something that you're able to feel comfortable with? Calling Baba, Daddy, Papa? Or do you feel that that's almost a little too disrespectful for you to have that kind of relationship with him? And again, it makes all the difference in the world when it comes to the quality of our lives. Just a huge difference in it. And it's liberating if we have this uh, understanding in our lives. C.S. Lewis uh, talked about us being jolly beggars, living in humble dependence on the Lord, not being uh, caught up with the gravity, the gravitas of sin and the law, but instead living in grace. That's what we're enabled to do because of this relationship that Christ has forged for us. So again, how are you doing when it comes to your Abba relationship? It's precious. It's important. 
And again, unless you become as little children and humble, dependent, trust, uh, should not enter the kingdom of God. So it's something that we need to cultivate in our lives, that daddy relationship. Are you able to say that? Daddy, when you're going along in life and calling upon the Lord, can you do that? And for me, what helps in my life, it's as I think um, this opportunity that I have, this privilege that I have of relationship with the Lord, that I can call on him 24-7, 365. He's always there. And he treats me as if I'm his only child. And he does the same for you. He's able to do that. So for us to reflect on that and to reflect on the fact that in our lives that God has always been in the shadows. He's been our shelter. He's been our protector for us, um, our shield. And even though there's been many times we've forgotten about him, pretending he wasn't there, he's been there for us. And especially think about the times when you've do, done things that, uh, that you're not happy about. As I think about some of the stupid things that I've done. But nonetheless, he's been patiently there for me. And hasn't he been there for you? I believe that's how we can cultivate that relationship of Abba, concerning our Lord. And as we recognize this in our lives, of how faithful that he's been to us, that he loves us no matter what, he never gives up on us. Never does he give up on us. And as we consider these things. Can't we say, I love you, I love you, I love you. There is the Abba relationship. And may that relationship uh, grow in your life and it's the work of the Holy Spirit, but may you uh, have these times of contemplation now at Christmas, but during the year. And uh, may this uh, relationship enrich you this quality of life, may you be overflowing with God's grace and mercy in this coming year, in Jesus' name. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts, keep your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And at this time, would you please rise as you're able for the affirmation of faith. When sin slithered into the world, cascading God's perfect creation into decay, God made a promise, I will send a savior. He said someone will arise who will crush evil under his foot. Years passed. The people of Israel, children of God, were taken captive. The presence of God seemed missing. The promise of God unfulfilled. He was a promise fulfilled, but most did not recognize him. Amen. Would you be seated for the prayers? O 
Almighty God, we thank you for your love and bringing your son, the great somebody who became a nobody that we all could become somebodies, your adopted children, that we are kind of enabled to have that John John relationship with you. We thank you, O Savior, full of grace, who has come into the world. In these days, we experience grace through our celebrations, but may it continue into the coming year as we hold fast to the truth that the long arm of your grace far supersedes the long arm of the law. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy Spirit, clothe us with the righteousness of our Savior. Strengthen us in faith, in this Abba relationship with you, this daddy relationship that is for us to receive, that would free us from the gravity of sin and the law, that we might fully live as jolly beggars, being enabled to live readily in your presence and know of your unfailing love. May this be so that we would be able to dispense with the filthy rags of our own righteousness and put out instead your love and your peace and care and compassion as your ch beloved children. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, through whom all things are possible, do the great miracle of deepening your church in the truths of your word, that a new reformation would arise and sweep across the world. Lord, this is possible, as again, nobodies are made into somebodies, and this grace of God flows to revival, to overflowing. We pray for people who are distanced from the faith, who are in the far country, as in the prodigal, pair of the prodigal son, powerfully turn them to you and marvelously transform them in spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we humbly ask you for the strength to better recognize opportunities to share your love with others and how best to witness our faith in a winsome way. And may it begin with a sense of your presence and of your love and may uh, you give us the words and the actions that would touch the lives of others. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And O oh God of comfort and hope, we pray for those who are experiencing difficulties during this time of the year due to the loss of a loved one. We ask that you would grant them peace. And also, Lord, that you would continue to bless our food pantry in the, in the new year, our efforts to open up uh, and with the Spirit's leading, touch other people's lives. May there even be new opportunities that would arise for this church. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our nation, Lord, that there would be uh, a good change when it comes to uh, the balance of power being switched in our governments, uh, grant wisdom to our new leaders. May they seek to conform themselves to your will and way, rather than the way of the world, of the secular, secular mindset of the culture. Lord, in your mercy, And Lord, hear the prayers of those who cry out to you in their illness and distress. We pray for Pat Sable recovering and Terry Pierce and also is home with mom but still recovering. For Jeanette Mashman who's in hospice, that you grant her your special peace and the family also. We pray for Lisa Schroeder. For Walter and Frank Cross, and Walter was in the hospital, have mercy. Also, Lord, we pray for Stephen Davidson, the beloved son, the pastor, that you would uh, bless him as he recovers from great weakness. 
We pray for Lillian Bandalo, the loved one of Herma, that you would grant special peace to her in these her latter days. And further, Lord, bless Sam Tormina and Marlene Johnson, Laura Lynn and Gwen Hay. We pray also for Mark Hess and Tracy Wood and Leslie Wood and also for Eric Bobka, that you'd have mercy and strengthen this young man in spirit. Lord, hear and answer in your good time and your good way. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we pray for Richard Choice, who uh, has a birthday for Heather Armstrong, that uh, you would uh, bless him with many more years of life and that you would work uh, in Harlan and Heather and uh, Garland's lives, that they might be able to uh, experience positive change uh, in their coming weeks. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we pray as you've taught us to pray. Our Father.